we are going to be discussing an in or a reduction in NHS waiting lists. Joining me now is Lord Norman Warmer, Warner, former Labour Minister. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us here on Talk TV. Let's start, if we may, discussing about these waiting lists. They are going down. The health secretary was on every news channel yesterday saying for five months in a row, the waiting lists have come down, but they are crucially still higher than the point at which Rishi Sunak pledged that he would bring them down. Politically, how damaging is this for the government, or do you think people are beginning to see things getting better? Well, undoubtedly, the numbers have come down a small amount, but there's still over six million people waiting for their treatment, and there's about 65,000 of those have been waiting for over a year. So if you're one of that 65,000, I don't think you'll be terribly thrilled by the relatively modest increases that there have been in the waiting list. Welcome as they are. Well, relatively modest reductions. No, and that's the real point, isn't it? Because these waiting lists, are 6.3 million people, as you say, it's not some number out there, even though we talk about the number it is millions of people waiting for a hip operation, living in pain or, or a cardiac operation, or even a relatively routine procedures like going and seeing a physiotherapist. The fact it's routine doesn't mean that it isn't deeply debilitating for you. Um, do you think there's a danger, we hear from Wes Streeting yesterday, that the Labour Party, if they get into power at the general election, will use private hospitals to tackle this uh, waiting list issue? Do you think there's a bit of a danger if the Labour Party get in that they're seeking to privatise the NHS by their back door? Well, I don't get carried away too much about um, privatising the NHS. I, I, As a health minister, I use the NHS um, and I only paid them at N NHS prices. I use that to try and stop some of this backlogging in elective surgery. And what I think I'd be saying to Wes Streeting now is you ought to start looking at the top management of the NHS and the Department of Health. I mean, the Health Foundation showed that actually the strikes have actually made a relatively modest contribution um, to the, the figures in the backlog. Um, what, so what you're getting really is some really deeply ingrained problems about the backlog and also about A&E, which we're not dis discussing today. I suppose what the government would say is that health spending since 2019 has gone up in real terms by nearly 14%. So if more money isn't the answer, maybe Wes Streeting is right. Maybe using the private sector more extensively is the answer. Um, or, you know, people at home will just believe they're saying, does, does anyone really know how to get through this, this COVID backlog, as the government might call it? Well... The backlog and, to some extent, the the A and E department are really a great deal about how you run the services. And okay, the private sector would help a bit, but you have to ask some questions now about the top management. M ministers don't run the NHS on a day to day basis. It's the people in charge in NHS England and the Department of Health who are re responsible for the day to day running. And if I was a minister, I'd be asking some pretty tough questions about why this is dragging on so long. Mm. And I haven't seen too many managers sacked. I haven't seen too many managers moved around. What we're seeing is something which is very bad for patients, which is the NHS settling into a particular way of working. And what we're streeting has to do is actually disturb that complacency. Well, Lord Warner, of course, last week we learned on Friday that the consultant's pay dispute was over with a £20,000, uh, up to £20,000 pay rise for consultants. Surely in a world where you were paid via performance, we'd be cutting the salaries of people working in the NHS because it simply um, is failing to deliver the service it's there to do. Well, I think there are some very difficult questions to be asked about this. I'm not close enough now to this to know what is the right thing to do. But I do know I wouldn't be putting up with this management, which has actually got us into this mess. 
And the, there are some questions to be asked of the government. I mean, if you were going to settle with the consultants, why wait for a year before you do it? Um, and that, that's a political judgment. But I don't think the politicians can be totally blamed, sad to say, for the way the NHS is actually being run today on a day-to-day -day basis. Lord Warner, I agree with you. Um, finally, are we this week in Parliament, uh, um, we are going to see Rishi Sunak's smoking ban debated. That is the idea that anyone currently the age of 15 will never be able to legally smoke. Boris Johnson has come up and come out and branded it as nuts. He said the idea that the Conservative Party, the party of Winston Churchill, will ban people from ever smoking a cigar seems, quote unquote, nuts. Do you agree with Boris or do you agree with Rishi? I rarely agree with Boris on many things, and I certainly wouldn't th take Mark Boris as my expert on public health. So I'd stick with Chris Whitty's idea. It's going to be a slow slog, and we've got to do more than that ban to actually persuade people not to smoke, and in some cases, not to vape. But, but, but banning things doesn't work. It's been illegal for decades for people to smoke cannabis in the UK. You can walk down any street in any major city up and down the land and smell it. Why do you think banning tobacco, a lifetime ban for people currently age, under the age of 15, will work when so many other bans have failed? Well, banning worked when we stopped people smoking uh, in their workplace and in public places. So bans have their place. And there is something to be said for making it more difficult for younger people to actually get access to tobacco and, and cigarettes. But it's already... Uh, but it's, it's, it's a already pretty long-term... Sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, though. Please finish. And it, and it's, but it's, it's still a problem because the, we've got a situation where smoking is still a major cause of disease uh, in, in, and, and the cost to the NHS. But so is alcohol. I mean, I, I just oppose this because, look, we live in a world... If you believe in freedom, you should believe in the freedom to make bad decisions. And the idea that you will, in several decades' time, have a 51-year-old who can legally go and buy himself a packet of cigarettes or pipe tobacco or a cigar or whatever, it, rolling tobacco, whatever it may be, and then a 50-year-old next-door neighbour who's it's illegal for him to buy tobacco. The idea that people can't make rational decisions about themselves in their 50s surely shouldn't be allowed in a society that believes in freedom of choice and freedom of the individual. Well, as I said, I wouldn't myself have gone along that particular path if I, if I was a minister, but I, d I don't altogether rule out banning. As, as I said, banning in the workplace, we have to consider what the impact is on other people around the people who are smoking. So we, we have had to ban um, smoking in public places and in the workplace. We've got to try and find some way of, of trying to get young people not to start down the path of what is a very, very addictive product. 